My husband lost both legs above the knee in 1979, October 15, 1979 to be precise. And I was happily practicing law and thinking I was safe for life. And that was a major disruptive fa uh, factor. I went into literal shock. For the first time in my life, I could solve uh, higher mathematical equations. First and the last time in my life. And I sat there and I was solving logarithms and working advanced mathematical calculations. And you have to understand, I went to law school because it was the only curriculum in the whole university that required no math. <laughs> and I seriously thought I was going to have to go back to school and retrain to be a doctor. In fact, I bought num numerous books on it. And then I went back to normal, 2 plus 2 equals 3, or is it 5? I'm not sure which. And there was a, a Methodist bookstore across the street from my downtown Detroit law office, Cokesbury Books. I went in there almost daily just to find things to help me make it from one day to another because it was a very, very tough period in my life even after I came back to normal on the mathematics versus the words. And I read things that I thought would get me through a very difficult point of my life. And when I was through with the good books in the store, and they had lots of good books by lots of good authors, I found another line of books. And the books were by Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Mennonites. And the books were saying things like, we need a new world order. We need to make this paradigm shift. Up until I discovered the New Age movement, I thought paradigm was 20 cents. <laughs> we need a, a transformation. We need to see ourselves as part of an interconnected whole. God's ways aren't our ways. Perhaps he intended for us to call him Shiva. And I started thinking I was looking at some very serious religious apostasy combined with some political elements. I worked for the Michigan legislature, the House of Representatives, before I even became an attorney. And I knew my way around political circles, and I knew political action campaigns when I solved them. And this looked like a combination of religion and politics. So one day I made a little trip over to the Archdiocese of Detroit to see if the same trends were continuing over there. And to my surprise, I saw many of the very same books, same authors, same propaganda line, same cover. Everything was the same except on the side of the Catholic books was a logo that said Paulist Press. And on the side of the, many of the Protestant books that I found with disturbing themes was a logo that said InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And I thought, isn't this cute? Here are all the... Protestants are being reached with a call for the New World Order by InterVarsity, and all the Catholics are being reached by Paulist Press. There were others, other publishers on both sides of the logo. I'm not singling those two out per se. And I thought all it cost them was a little change in logo on the side of the book. And I really didn't put it together. I, one day I bought five books and took them home and just sliced and underlined, yellow highlighted. and Mark the common elements. One of the books was Towards a Human World Order by Gerald and Patricia Meshi, and yes, they were talking about sustainable development. Another book I bought was Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger by Ron Sider. And I, a book, When Gods Change, Hope for Humanity, by a professor at the Union Graduate School of Theology. I believe his name was John McCoy. Bought a little book on process theology. And the books all sounded far more like each other than they did their, the respective teachings of their respective denominations. And I wondered where were they getting this? I thought for the very first time in my life that maybe I should write a book. And I was going to call it, my original thought was, call it, come out of her, my people. The growing apostasy of American religious life. 
I had no idea I was looking at something far, far bigger. And I had a very prophetic thought that came to me. I never thought of myself as a prophet, but this day I had a thought that was distinctly prophetic. I never thought, would anybody publish your book? Would anybody read your book? The only thought that came to me was, boy, will you ever catch it if you do? Well, I wrote the book. It ended up being called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, and I've been catching it ever since. And what happened to me along the course of that work was very interesting. I, the opposition came from where I least expected it. The support often came from where I least expected it. When I found these facts that compelled me to write it, I remember I sat there and I thought political suicide, professional suicide, political suicide, professional suicide. And I finally just started brightening the corner where I was. I started with educating the people in close circles to me, the ones I came in contact every day. And every person in our office could tell you about this and have an intelligent discussion. Everybody that waited on me on a routine basis where I ate lunch in downtown Detroit could tell you about it. And friends that I thought would abandon me kind of closed ranks behind me and basically gave me some pretty good moral support while this was taking place. I remember I showed the materials to my pastor who went on to become the head of Moody Bible Institute. And I thought he would take the ball and run with it. I hoped he would take the ball and run with it. Basically, he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And at that point, I thought, my clients pay me for advice. They'll listen. So my clients, anybody that scheduled an appointment with me, ended up getting a seminar on the New Age movement, whether they wanted it or not. <laughs> And they went out and they told their respective ministers and priests and friends about it. I had a call one day from a Catholic priest in Detroit, Father Edward Perone, and he said that um, a parishioner who had not darkened a church door in many years had uh, come to see him and uh, was terrified. He said, what did you have that scared this man so badly? I invited him to come take a look. Well, he came to my office on a Friday afternoon. He looked through my materials. He gasped at some of them. He said, I can hardly believe I'm holding this in my hand. And finally, he said, I have to accept the truth of what you're saying. He said, I saw too much of this going through the seminary. He said, we have a terrible job facing us, how to wake people up without scaring them to death. Because when I was looking at the materials, and I have something that on the computer I'd like to show you later when I can set up adequately for the PowerPoint. But 1983, the New Agers really thought they were going to pull things off in 1982. 1982 was a target year for them. 1975 was a target year to make teachings on their new Messiah public. But at the point I was looking at it, I didn't know I was looking at that yet. I didn't understand fully what I was looking at until I found a book by a California writer named Marilyn Ferguson called The Aquarian Conspiracy, Personal and Social Change in the 1980s. And all the things I found disturbing, she found encouraging. She said, now the heretics are gaining ground. Doctrine is losing its authority and knowing is superseding belief. And she quoted from a book called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. And for some reason, when I read the quote, I thought it was terribly important that I find that book, and I did track it down the very next day at the Methodist bookstore, I'm sorry to say. And Dixie, Dixon Bible and Books, which was owned by a member of my own church, I'm sorry to say, had copies of the book in stock as well. And it was basically written in King James style English. 
And this was about Jesus, obviously, the Jeff Setter. He wasn't hanging around Palestine. He was traveling to India and China. And the Aquarian master sitting in council had um, told us that Jesus was not always the Christ, that just as Jesus had earned the degree Christ by a life of strenuous service and equipping himself to find the Christ God consciousness, um, that Jesus wasn't always, just as Lincoln was not always president, Edward was not always king, neither was Jesus always the Christ. He had earned the degree Christ by these uh, certain practices.